Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin, is one of the most influential revolutionaries of all time, both for his role in the Soviet Union and for inspiring countless revolutions after him. A revolutionary, communist, and a self-proclaimed Marxist, i.e., adhering to the political and economic theories of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And yet there is also a scholarly debate about if Lenin was even a Marxist, or at least that he wasn't a very good one. How is that possible? Why wouldn't he be a Marxist? Firstly, there are those who charge that Lenin's views were contradictory to Marx's, or were revisionist, meaning his theory significantly revised fundamental aspects of Marxist theory to undermine its central tenets, such that it doesn't constitute Marxism at all anymore. Usually, it is accepted that Marxist theory is supposed to be adapted to material conditions, meaning it can and should be updated to the situation of one's time. Those who charge Lenin of being revisionist assert that he did much more than just adapt. Secondly, there is the historical context in Russia and in Lenin's own life that included very non-Marxist elements, which likely shaped and informed his own beliefs. For the Soviet Union, as well as Marxist-Leninists worldwide, it was politically expedient to downplay any non-Marxist elements in Lenin to place him firmly as a spiritual successor to Marx. If any other influences were acknowledged, they were to be secondary to Marx. As such, a lot of misconceptions have been spread that downplay Lenin's earlier political activism or fabricate connections to Marxist groups to bolster Lenin's resume. However, as we will see, the reality is more complicated, and in many respects, it was these other influences that had the strongest effect on Lenin's theories. What were the material conditions of Tsarist Russia? And what was Lenin's path to Marxism like? First of all, let's summarize some basic Marxist theory so that we can contrast this with Lenin's beliefs and actions. In Marxist theory, it is generally understood that stages of history are found in modes of production. Our production then creates our institutions. To understand human culture means you must understand the material reality that they are based on first, argues Marx. Things like ideology, politics, etc., called the superstructure, reflect and protect the economic foundation. As the mode of production evolves, it encounters contradictions based on differing classes having different material interests, which are resolved with more advanced economic systems, which develop new societies. In the case of Western Europe, this was broadly thought to take the form of feudalism leading to capitalism leading to communism. The two classes that people were increasingly falling into were the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, those that control the means of production and those who sell their labor power to them as workers. And for Marx, presently existing society was rapidly creating the proletariat. Then when capitalism inevitably reaches an impasse, the proletariat, comprising an immense majority, would have to implement a social revolution and create a new mode of production. This would create a considerably more democratic society, because the majority would finally wrest control over rulership for the first time. This was a great departure from old theories of history. For Marx, history was not the progression of great ideas or great men enacting them, but based on the unavoidable influence of economic developments on the progression of societies. Keep that in mind when we consider what Lenin wanted to do, and did. In the 19th century, Russia was an increasingly absolute monarchy, at a time when autocracy was becoming increasingly unsustainable. The century began with the Napoleonic Wars, when Russia was invaded, scorched its country, but boldly pushed Napoleon back, with Tsar Alexander I becoming the conservative bulwark against the ideals of the French Revolution. When Alexander died in 1825, educated elites and officers mutinied for a constitution in what became the Decemberist Revolt, but were crushed by the new Tsar Nicholas I. This event only hardened the Tsardom against liberal reform. Strict censorship and surveillance by secret police completely alien to the rest of Europe was introduced. Russia not only crushed its uprisings, but also intervened to crush uprisings abroad, signifying that Russia sought to defend the conservative status quo. That is, until Nicholas's reign ended with a humiliating defeat in the Crimean War, revealing just how behind Russia was. This motivated the belief that Russia had to adapt, and it led to one of the most major reforms in Russian history, the Emancipation of 1861, finally ending serfdom. That's right, Russia still had serfdom in the 1800s, but at least serfdom was better than slavery, barely. To be a serf meant being tied to the land, owned by a landlord, who forced you to work to pay him, limited your movements and freedoms, could buy and sell you at auction, and could enforce obedience through corporal punishment. The vast majority of the population, tens of millions of people, were either serfs for the state or for private owners, the latter forcing their serfs into estates, sweatshops, whatever. After the Crimean War, it became embarrassingly clear that this arrangement wasn't working. 
for one, the rest of the civilized world was really starting to look down on serfdom and slavery, and the practice was becoming a black stain on the reputation of Russia. It was also limiting Russia. Modern wars weren't going to be won off conscripted serfs, nor could they build an industrial superpower off what was essentially agrarian slavery. Not to mention, the longer serfdom was carried on, the more the threat of the peasants rising up would hang over Russia, argued Alexander II. That said, emancipation would still be a decades-long process, with peasants being treated as second-class citizens and having to buy their freedom from their former masters or take out credit from the state to do so. And the peasants were not freed individually, but as communes, creating patriarchal enclaves that the peasants were still economically and culturally tied to and controlled by. The peasants were still forced to rent much of their land from the landlords, effectively sharecropping, leading to an inefficient and technologically backwards agricultural sector. Even after the reforms, for the vast majority of the population, one's life did not expand beyond the rural commune. The profound influence of peasant life on Russian culture can be perceived just from examining the Russian word mir, translated either as the rural commune, peace, world, or universe. Despite fervent attempts to industrialize in the later half of the century, depending on how you count it, 77 to 87 percent of the population would be agrarian at any point in time. Well, in the 1897 census, industrial workers numbered a little over 2 million, about 1.67 percent. Therefore, when socialism came to Russia, it was applied to these very agrarian circumstances. It is possible that the ubiquitous myrrh was one of the influences on the later concept of democratic centralism that Lenin coined. The system where debate and voting is allowed at first, but once a decision is made, everyone is to fall in line and be bound by it. Once common in agrarian societies, in Russia there was a tradition of democracy being associated with unanimous decision and the will of the collective. In the commune, the farmers debated, but ultimately came to a unanimous decision about what crops to plant, with each member agreeing to the collective decision. While some intellectuals interpreted the unanimous votes as proof of social harmony, a small clique of elders and successful farmers tended to dominate, not necessarily the richest, but the oldest. By and large, this was not capitalist exploitation or social harmony, but traditional society and oral culture, where customs passed down generations as a model for the village in the future, and the experienced elders had sway. There was mistrust of outside ideas and protection of the old way of life. That said, in the 19th century the communes were evolving, younger people were starting to attend schools or migrate into the cities. Lands were being partitioned more and more, family sizes were decreasing, which was causing moral, social, and economic alarm for the government. Young peasants wanted to create their own farms to be in charge of their own fate, even if the farms were smaller and less economically viable, and they dreamt of being able to hire their own laborers to the chagrin of later socialists. This suffering did not go unnoticed by the intellectual elite of the country. For the past century, privileged elites had been encouraged to serve the state, seek education, and rise through the table of ranks. But intellectuals were beginning to shun civil service out of principle. With the rise of nationhood and the increasing focus on the people, the educated elites were interpreting service not as working for the state, but for the long exploited peasants. Russian intellectuals were fascinated with these rural folk that they knew so little about, setting up ethnographic museums where they could learn about their own exotic rural population. Famous writers like Dostoevsky called emancipation a monumental occasion like the conversion of Russia to Christianity and called upon Russians to overcome their class divisions, writing, Every Russian is a Russian first of all, and only after that does he belong to a class. With tens of millions of serfs being emancipated, in 1874, thousands of students, intellectuals, and revolutionaries, known as the Narodniks, or populists, with feelings of guilt from their privilege, heeded this call and left their college campuses and began the To the People movement, traveling to the countryside, living and learning amongst the peasants, teaching them educations, and if one was revolution inclined, trying to incite the peasants to want revolution too. They hoped to learn the peasants' way of life and earn their trust, then convince them of the horrors of their condition. All over, there was a belief that the people were the carriers of national culture and pride. For the Narodniks, the peasants were the natural socialists, embodying the collective spirit. For the Democrats, the champions of liberty. For the nationalists, the natural Russian patriot. Now, the Narodniks were not Marxists, and the two groups fought against each other immensely when Marxism came to Russia. For the Narodniks, the belief was that if they could protect and cultivate the culture of the peasant communes, they could either create a socialist utopia without going through capitalism at all, or quickly mobilize the peasants to crush it. They viewed the peasantry as a united class leading the charge, as opposed to the Marxist view that the peasants were rapidly dividing and that revolution would be led by the proletariat. 
the Neurodniks were inspired by Nikolai Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be Done, which offered a sort of blueprint for the new utopian society and how a heroic revolutionary should conduct himself. This novel and the tradition of utopian socialism, the people that Marx criticized in the Communist Manifesto, featured a strong-willed hero, a great man character, who adopts an ascetic existence and becomes solely dedicated to the revolution. The novel focuses on the goodness of man moving history and celebrates violence committed in the name of progress, and at times it shows a great condescension toward the masses and some intellectual arrogance, when for example characters are put down for not knowing enough French. All this to say, the novel portrayed a path unlike the outline in Marxist theory, yet without freedom of expression or open politics, it was the Russian novelist who spearheaded revolutionary theory. The revolutionaries emulated the virtuous heroes of Chernyshevsky, hoping to achieve their utopias through similar extreme discipline and dedication. Despite this romanticized view, the revolutionaries soon found that the majority of the population was not receptive to their revolutionary message. The peasants didn't know what the hell they were talking about, and didn't take kindly to these city big shots coming in and telling them what to do. The revolutionaries were attacked, reported to authorities, or just ignored. As for overthrowing the Tsar, confused peasants told the outsiders they loved the Tsar, like a human god, couldn't imagine life without him. This was rationalized by arguing that the peasants simply had a false consciousness. That is, being conditioned or misled into thinking against one's class interests by the dominant ideology of the time. As an analogy, consider how in the antebellum South, the slave-owning minority created all kinds of ideological justifications and arguments, based on phrenology and pseudoscience, the Bible, what have you, to explain why slavery was good and natural actually, to the point where even some slaves believed or accepted these justifications as just how things were. Likewise, the peasantry of Russia grew up believing it was only natural to be enserved and inferior to a God-ordained nobility, and the Russian socialists would have to change this belief. While the going to the people movement mostly failed, two main currents emerged. Firstly, many populists continued working with the peasants, teaching them to read and establishing schools. Decades of this outreach would help the Neuronik's successive political party, the Socialist Revolutionaries, become the most popular party in Russia in 1917. However, for a small number of the Neuronics, this was not good enough. The second tendency to develop was that of terrorism. Living in a police state, where one was not free to do anything unless the state approved it, where every letter was intercepted, where any house could be suddenly searched, and where political thinkers were constantly being sent off to prison, engendered a certain mentality in the revolutionary movement. Rejecting cooperation with the state and facing absurd levels of repression, members of the middle class were pushed into the terrorist movement. Their actions, they argued, were for the good of the people, more important than the law, justifying just about anything. Thus was born Nerodia Volya, the People's Will, a terrorist organization that would seek its vengeance on the Tsar for his centuries of oppression. The idea being to slay the Tsar and hopefully destabilize the state so that a revolution could take place. Over the next few decades, Russia entered an unparalleled era of political violence, with some 17,000 Tsarist officials being killed or wounded, and retributive violence following. Prime ministers, governors, mayors, police, and most famously of all, in 1881, Tsar Alexander II himself was killed. One of the ringleaders of the assassination, Andrei Zulyabov, would give a slogan that resonated with the future Lenin, History moves too slowly, it needs a push. Eyewitness accounts describe the young Lenin as a model student, probably destined for a career in the Tsar's regime as a noble. Despite later mythologizing that Lenin must have been a revolutionary child prodigy, the young Lenin at first wasn't interested in politics at all. Old Bolshevik Nikolai Valentinov once remarked that Lenin's early revolutionism was a fairy tale. That is to say, he was a normal kid. In the summer of 1886, Lenin's brother Alexander came home with a copy of Marx's Capital. According to their sister Anna, Lenin didn't even look at it. In those days, he was addicted to fiction, reading Turgenev. But then when Lenin was 17, perhaps one of the most formative experiences of his life took place. His older brother Alexander was arrested for plotting to kill the Tsar. To the surprise of the rest of the family, Alexander had joined the terrorists around January 1887. After being swept up in the revolutionary circles and literature of St. Petersburg, he was executed that May. Four years older than Lenin, Lenin looked up to his brother and sought to emulate him to the point of triviality. The young Lenin, who thought he knew his brother well, was shocked to discover the secret dimension of his character. After this, Lenin would follow in his footsteps. That summer, he reproached himself and attempted to investigate as much about his brother as possible. This was perhaps the turning point of his life, as when Lenin was arrested for the first time years later, he said, 
What is there to think? My path has been blazed by my older brother. When Lenin later called himself a Marxist, he said he was following the example of his brother. Yet in 1887, he still wasn't exactly at Marx. He began reading immensely his family's books. That summer, he rediscovered Chernyshevsky and his Bible of the Russian Revolutionaries, What is to be Done? He read it over and over again in 1887 and 1888 and all throughout his life. It would be from this very non-Marxist novel, Not Marx, that Lenin was introduced to revolutionary socialism. He said it himself that it exerted the main overwhelming influence on me before my acquaintance with the works of Marx, Engels, and Plekhanov. When Lenin was exiled to Siberia, he kept a picture each of Marx, Engels, Gerzen, Pizarev, and two of Chernyshevsky. Well, in later Soviet mythology, Lenin was always revolution-bound and Marxist-oriented. This claim is disputed by Lenin's own admissions and the testimony of his siblings and peers, who noted he was not political at all at first, let alone a Marxist. And despite the posthumous claim that he rebuked the terrorism of his brother with a dramatic declaration, the reality seems to be that he very much sought to emulate his brother at first, and did not rebuke Narodia Volya. Family friend Kashkatamova wrote that when Lenin learned of his brother's activities, he had to act this way, he could not act otherwise. And sure enough, Lenin joined his first revolutionary groups, led by such people as Lazar Bogoraz and Maria Chetvergova, explicitly hoping to revive Narodia Volya and assassinate the Tsar. He was mingling with some of the city's leading populists and Jacobins, and followers of Sergei Nechayev. Soviet historiography would later create the theory that Lenin was joining Marxist circles in Kazan over the terrorist groups. As one of the pioneers of Russian Marxism, Nikolai Fedoseyev happened to be present in Kazan at the time. But by Lenin's own admission, while he had heard of Fedoseyev and wrote to him in the mid-1890s, he never personally met him, and regarding other local Marxists, there's no mention of them in the writings at all, so this is likely a fabrication. Lenin would say he did not become acquainted with Marx until later, only starting to read Capital in 1889, and he perhaps only became interested in Marxism in 1892, when considering the feasibility of social democracy in Russia, according to his sister Anna. Lenin more or less confirms that most revolutionaries had their beginning this way, writing, Many of the social democrats begin to develop a revolutionary frame of mind as followers of Narodnia Volya. In their early youth, almost all of them bowed in exultation before the heroes of terror, Rejecting the fascinating impression of this heroic tradition required a struggle and was accompanied by a break with the people who at all costs wanted to remain true to Neronia Volya and for whom the young social democrats had high respect. In 1921, Lenin would fill out a party questionnaire asking when his revolutionary participation began. He answered, it began in 1892-93 in Samara. This seems to indicate he didn't consider his Marxist career starting until later, and also that he seemingly wanted to conceal his pre-Marxist activity in Kazan. So at first Lenin was mingling with non-Marxist revolutionaries and terrorists. What were their theories of revolution? In Russian revolutionary theory, we see a long line of thinkers interested in revolution by the will of elite individuals. For the Decemberists, there was Pavel Pastel, who envisioned a sort of transitional totalitarian state with continued repression to coerce the population. The next generations contributed the emphasis on social justice and the blind faith in the inevitability and desirability of the revolution. Then there was the experience of the Narodniks, which led to the belief that the majority of the population was not ready for revolution. A revolution has to be organized, wrote one Narodnik. One school of thought, Alexander Gerzen for example, argued democracy was still paramount. If the majority of the population was against revolution, they just had to keep educating the people until they formed a majority, lest the revolution just result in another dictatorship. But for others, it seemed history needed a push. It needed an elite group of people to lead the majority. They needed professional revolutionaries. Nechayev called for using the Tsarist methods against the Tsarists, for the revolutionary to destroy everyone who stands in his way. From this tradition developed a sort of Jacobinism, or the idea of a radical restructuring of society around a dictatorship, which would preside over the revolutionary state through terror. According to Jacobins like Pyotr Zechnevsky, they should have a violent seizure of power by a small but well-disciplined group of conspirators, establishing a revolutionary dictatorship carrying out the societal transformation and the elimination of enemies. According to one contemporary, Lenin was immediately interested in Jacobinism and the question of seizure of power, never questioning its feasibility nor desirability. Until the early 1890s, one possibility was a spontaneous peasant uprising in the tradition of famous peasant rebels like Pugachev. He would never quite abandon his Narodnia inclinations. One of these writers who seems to have had a great influence on Lenin was Pyotr Tkachev. 
Tukhaychov wrote, The revolutionary shouldn't wait for the contradictions of capitalism to inevitably result in a revolution of the masses, but to make one for them. They should form a vanguard of the elite and educated professional revolutionaries who would form a highly disciplined and dedicated conspiracy that through terror and a coup would seize power and create a revolutionary dictatorship which would oversee the transition to socialism for the people. The people couldn't initiate a revolution on their own or from simple agitation, Tukhachev argued, because the ruling class possessed far greater means to influence them, and if anything, the time to strike was before the bourgeoisie got any stronger, not in reaction to their dominance. For Tukhaychov, the revolution was unquestionably feasible, desirable, and urgently needed, with his works in the 1870s sharing remarkable similarities to Lenin's on the eve of the October Revolution. Lenin is known to have read and reread, with the greatest care and attention, Tukhaychov, Nietzscheev, and other such writers, and recommended them to the Bolsheviks while in exile in Geneva. Now, in the late 1800s, it was almost fashionable to call oneself a Marxist among the intelligentsia. However, historians and Marxists then and now widely agree Tukhaychev actually was not one. Engels, in fact, criticized Tukhaychev in his writings in 1874, and Marx and Engels both criticized Jacobinism in their later writings. What was Tukhaychev then? He was accused of simply repeating the ideas of French non-Marxist Louis Blochy. He too advocated for a small group of highly organized and disciplined conspirators to seize control over the state, and for this vanguard to establish a temporary dictatorship over the population. This movement wouldn't require the popular support of the majority or be led by the working class. Instead of a dictatorship of the proletariat, it was effectively a dictatorship for the proletariat. Marx and Engels denounced this, because for them, the working class had to achieve their own emancipation. It had to be the entire class of proletarians, the mass of society in the advanced countries who carried this revolution, the movement of the immense majority, and the interests of the immense majority. Meanwhile, Marx's capital finally arrived in Russia in 1872, miraculously being led in by the censors because they thought no one would read it and understand it, and because they thought the descriptions of capitalism didn't apply to Russia. Yet read it was. For the peasant-loving populace and Slavophiles, it confirmed the horrors of capitalism that Russia should not enter. For others, it was the solution to the backward peasants' problem. It shifted the focus to the industrial working class. Working with the peasants was now small deeds. Plus the famine of 1891 seemed to indicate the backward peasants were dying out and would be rapidly replaced by workers. For Russian thinkers, Marxism seemed an absolute science promising an optimistic future, in which Russia becoming an advanced country like the illustrious West was inevitable. While they continued to mingle and steal from each other, Marxism and populism would start to split into two camps. When Lenin finally read Marx, he was already primed with the teachings of the people's will, Chernyshevsky and Tukhaychov, and his readings would be infused with ideas of Russian Jacobism. From the non-Marxist tradition, he adopted the need for a disciplined revolutionary vanguard, the belief that their actions would alter the objective course of history, the idea of seizing the state apparatus to institute social revolution, his defense of Jacobin methods of dictatorship, and his contempt for liberals, democrats, and other critics. Rather than passively waiting for the need for revolution to mature based on objective conditions per Marx, Lenin added conspiratorial politics to the mix based on the revolutionary tradition of Russia. From Marx, he adopted his sociology and transferred his focus from the peasantry to the proletariat, soon abandoning his belief in the spontaneous peasant uprising, considering the peasants reactionary. With a proletarian revolution on the way, in what the friends of the people are, Lenin argued against cooperation with liberals and called for the full and final break with the ideas of the Democrats. But then, in the 1890s, he began to mellow out as he came under the influence of Marxist rock star Georgi Plekhanov. Plekhanov's belief was that Russia was only beginning to turn capitalist, and therefore, that Russia needed a two-stage revolution. The workers and bourgeoisie were technically on the same side in overthrowing the autocracy in the first revolution, and he said, seizing power pre-capitalism would simply lead to despotism in communist form. Hmm. Lenin temporarily did a 180, now respecting cooperation with liberals and bourgeoisie against Tsarism, and advocated for civil liberties and democracy. Soon after, Lenin wrote his first major work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia. Unlike the Narodniks who argued that capitalism wasn't developing, or shouldn't, Lenin argued it was developing, and should. But unlike other Marxists, he took a highly ambitious view of the rise of capitalism thus far. 
Yet, most of the workers were seemingly inclined to improve their lot in capitalism than to want to overthrow it, leading to the Marxists encountering the same problem the populace had. What to do when people don't care for your propaganda? They began organizing mass campaigns on specific labor issues, taking part in workers' strikes and learning their language. While this strategy was working, it was also leading to what Lenin called economism, or focusing solely on the betterment of economic conditions through piecemeal improvements, to the distraction and detriment of the political movement as a whole. The workers largely argued they should be left to pursue this goal, free from the Marxist intelligentsia. And similarly, many leading socialists were adopting revisionism, championed by Edward Bernstein, who argued that maybe capitalism wasn't inevitably getting worse and imminently about to collapse, but rather could be worked within and reformed, instead of overthrown in a revolution. For a brief moment, it seemed that the less revolutionary factions might even come together and form a new, unified movement for constitutional reform, and abandon revolution in Russia entirely. For Lenin, these were huge problems. The Marxists urgently needed to centralize. They needed a disciplined vanguard like the people's will. They needed to form a political party. Having temporarily tried to work with them, it was at this point Lenin broke with the Democrats and their ideas of democracy. It was in this atmosphere that Lenin began writing his What Is To Be Done, hearkening back to the old classic and staking a claim to being the new spiritual leader. In this, he denounced the revisionists, yet in many respects would revise Marx himself. Unlike, say, Germany, the material conditions of Tsarist Russia were particularly dire, Lenin argued, due to Russia's uniquely autocratic repression and outlawing of political organization and the imbuing of a widespread false consciousness, making an open and democratic party nearly impossible. Additionally, the ruling classes had far greater resources to influence the masses. Thus, he argued that the workers would not develop political consciousness spontaneously, as spontaneous actions like strikes were placated by economic concessions, like minimal wage increases, while ultimately distracting and detracting from the political struggle. Lenin wanted to overhaul the whole system and return the maximum amount to the workers, not have them settle for small concessions. Therefore, he proposed forming a centralized and disciplined party, a vanguard party, made up of the most dedicated professional revolutionaries, who would be tasked with educating the workers and leading them in a revolution, in which members were to follow the central commands, rebuking broad democracy as a useless and harmful toy, to use the police's own tactics against them. Unlike Marx's revolutionary class consciousness being the product of life experiences as a worker, Lenin affirmed that class consciousness would be brought to the workers from outside, now, if any of this sounds familiar, it's because Lenin's argument is almost exactly to Kaichov's, which led to Lenin being criticized for the same reasons, and his critics calling him a blockiest. At first, Lenin defended Jacobism, and described the Bolsheviks as the Jacobins of contemporary social democracy, although after 1905, fought to disassociate the two. Unlike Marx and Engels, who thought the revolution would be winning the battle for democracy, as the proletariat established a majority over the former exploiters in the dictatorship of the proletariat, followed by the gradual withering away of the state, Tkaichov sought to convert the state into a revolutionary state, conceiving the dictatorship of the proletariat as ruled by the vanguard minority over the non-revolutionary majority. This is seemingly a fundamental change from Marx who while advocating for a party in the Communist Manifesto, stated that they should have no interests separate and apart from the proletariat, nor should they set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists were to be a section of the working class movement, which would aid in the formation of the proletariat into a class for the conquest of political power by the proletariat, not to do it for them. Therefore, many people read Lenin as seemingly displaying a profound mistrust of the masses and their revolutionary potential. In the urgent tasks of our movement, he added, the labor movement degenerates and inevitably becomes bourgeois, and therefore, their task was not to merely assist the worker, but to direct him. The revolutionary consciousness seemed the prerogative of a few, while the masses were reactionary. And who would make up this vanguard? Many people read this to mean mostly intellectuals, in fact that's what it says on Wikipedia. But perhaps realizing the elitism that this implies, many others will argue that's not what he meant. The confusion arises because in the text he seems to strongly imply it, saying in the same paragraph that the workers cannot develop socialist consciousness themselves, but the intellectuals do. He then quotes the profoundly true and important words of Karl Kotsky, who says that socialist consciousness is introduced by the intellectuals to the proletariat. Lenin then says, there can be no talk of an independent ideology formulated by the working masses themselves. Although in the footnotes he clarifies, this is not to say that they can have no part, but not as workers, rather socialist theoreticians. 
Needless to say, this seemed to imply to Lenin's peers that if the workers can't develop their consciousness, but the intellectuals can, that the vanguard would essentially be intellectuals leading workers. And Lenin got a lot of flack for this. He responded by, at best clarifying, or at worst, completely backtracking. At the Second Congress of the RSDLP in 1903, he defended himself by saying, Actually, I do want workers in the party, fully trained conscious workers, when they develop, mind you. And then said basically, since the economists were extreme in one direction, he had to go extreme in the other. Nonetheless, this idea about limiting the party to a smaller number of people was still unexpected. At the Congress, Lenin's belief in a centralized and conspiratorial party of professional revolutionaries in the tradition of the people's will led to an immediate schism regarding how exclusive membership should be. The Marxist parties of the past had been understood to be broad democratic mass movements arising from the working class, so when Lenin proposed a very restrictive membership, his critics argued he was eroding the democratic element for centralized dictatorship. Initially outvoted, when seven delegates walked out of the party, Lenin became the majority, the Bolsheviks, taking full control of the party's central committee and its newspaper editorial board. His opponents, the Mensheviks, accused him of acting like dictator of the party, which was breaking down not over just political differences, but primarily from petty squabbles and personal reasons. Arriving in Geneva in 1904, Nikolai Valentinov described the Bolsheviks of this period as being largely defined not by a political issue, but by personal loyalty to Lenin, writing about an atmosphere of worship of Lenin, which people calling themselves Bolsheviks had created, and with Lenin denouncing the Mensheviks as traitors and forbidding his comrades from talking to them without approval. Trotsky called him a terrorist and despot, and accused Lenin of turning the Central Committee into the Committee of Public Safety, with himself as Robespierre. People like Rosa Luxemburg and Pavel Axelrod called him a Jacobin, if not theocratic in his strictness. The Mensheviks, denying the need for a central leader at first, were by comparison less disciplined and organized, eventually being forced to follow the Bolsheviks' example. But they also remained more democratic and attracted a wider range of people from different walks of life, perhaps leading to their inclination toward compromise, even with the bourgeoisie. Did Lenin's beliefs stay like this? After the outbreak of the Great War, his beliefs debatably shift more towards Marx. As disillusioned by many of the orthodox Marxists voting in favor of the war, he did a deep dive of his own into Marx, Hegel, and other philosophical texts. Reading Capital in 1915, he came to a slightly self-deprecating realization, declaring, Half a century later, none of the Marxists understood Marx! and writing on the eve of the revolution in 1917, some of which was eventually published in the Staden Revolution, Lenin seemed to have rediscovered Marx. He seemed to realize his previous understanding of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which he had carried since meeting Plekhanov, to be considerably off base, now writing that the task of revolution was not to reappropriate the state, but to smash it. That said, he never quite abandoned his old beliefs or his reverence of Plekhanov, or spoke much publicly about his rediscovery of philosophy. And when the revolution did break out, Lenin returned to many of his Jacobin tendencies. Despite Lenin's dismissal of the workers' spontaneity, ironically, in 1917 the workers did spontaneously revolt and initiate the February Revolution. This event took Lenin and the Bolsheviks completely by surprise, with Lenin being in Switzerland at the time. A month earlier he had written that he conceded he and the older generation may not live to see the revolution. When one broke out, he dismissed it as a plot of the Allies, believing it incomprehensible that the masses without elite guidance had made a genuine revolution. Though as the situation became clearer, Lenin became increasingly frustrated by the Bolsheviks floundering the opportunity. One of the major accusations levied against Lenin was that at this point he became an opportunist, as when he returned to the scene, he began shifting his rhetoric to the revolutionary zeitgeist, even contradicting earlier Bolshevik positions. Nonetheless, taking advantage of the precarious political situation, the Bolsheviks launched the October Revolution and seized power. In doing so, Lenin reveals another major aspect that may contradict Marx, perhaps not from his beliefs, but what his actions proved. It had been understood there was a direct correlation between a country's socio-economic development and their radicalism, with the most industrially advanced countries being the most inclined to overthrow capitalism. Therefore, the revolution would begin in Germany, for example. Yet in 1917, a socialist revolution began in Russia, and unlike Germany, survived there, much to Lenin's own surprise. It would be the most economically backwards nations, often suffering immense exploitation or domination at the hands of the advanced countries, that would spawn the major communist rebellions. While Lenin maintained world revolution would be global and led by the industrialized nations, 
He was quietly revising Marxist theory to explain why the country suffering from imperialism saw the contradictions of capitalism even more pronounced. Leninism became a doctrine of economic development also for the sake of national emancipation, an anti-Western rebellion. For this reason, in 1920, he suggested the classic slogan of proletarians of all countries unite might be updated to proletarians of all countries and oppressed nations unite. Whether or not Lenin proved Marx wrong or not is debatable, but once in power, Lenin began to see many of the complexities of rule and of socialism in an agrarian country. The experience of defending against the West further emboldened his belief in the need for a strong state to defend the revolution. He noted that early Soviet Russia struggled to drive out the backwardness in the countryside and that it would be a long process to do so. In 1921, at the 10th Party Congress, the man who once complained that history moved too slowly said, what is needed is a much longer period of preparation, a slower tempo. In conclusion, while Lenin called himself a Marxist and based his political philosophy on Marxism, he also incorporated elements from the long-standing Russian revolutionary tradition. He followed in the footsteps of his brother and the people's will in preferring a conspiratorial organization that would use acts of terror. Despite the myth perpetuated by the Soviet Union that he was always a Marxist and revolutionary through and through, his path to politics was not just from Marxism, but from many Jacobin organizations. He took from the lessons of the populists and the Jacobins, adopting the idea of an elite vanguard to seize power and create a revolutionary state. He pragmatically shifted his beliefs and adapted to different currents in the lead up to the October Revolution, and he ultimately provided a counterpoint to the Marxist belief that Russia was not ready for a revolution by leading one.